So I'm from, I'm from North Carolina, uh, born and raised in Charlotte. And each summer, uh, for a week or two weeks, we would go to the coast, down the beach of North Carolina. And I wasn't really a, a beach reader. I didn't read a lot of the beach. It's far too hot in North Carolina. Uh, and I didn't really play games or run. I would really just, just sit and watch the shore. And if you sit long enough and watch the waves, you realize that nothing, nothing really changes other than the birds. And so uh, we had birds, uh, something like this in North Carolina, the willet um, or the, the ibis. And they would stand on the shore and just pick at the sand for something to feed on. Or even on the edge of the waves, they would run back and forth and pick out a few small fish without even getting wet. And there were birds who would also glide above the surface. You had the black skimmer on the top right who would, who would glide along and when uh, it saw a fish would just dip down and, and, and pull it right out of the water. And then of course you had the pelicans who when they saw a fish would, would, would rise up and then slam down on the, on the surface of the water and throw their head in and pull out a fish like they were bobbing for apples. Now I've watched these birds for years and to me on the beach this was a part of one of the beach. This was the way that birds fish. Well, my wife, as many of you know, is, a, is an anthropologist and she does research in Peru. And so this summer we had the chance to go down and we lived in Lima. And Lima, Peru, is, is right on the coast. And so several mornings I had the chance to go and, and to sit on the beach uh, looking out at the water. And, and one day I was watching these birds glide right, right above the water. And I was waiting to see uh, how they would feed, if they would land on the, on the shore or if they would scoop down. And I expected them to, 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 to fall in line in such a way. And, and this, is what I, this is what I saw. Not a speaker sitting there. Okay. <laughs> the bird was coming along, and it goes in. And I was, it, it, it comes out. And I, it, it, it threw me. It, it, it honestly, threw, I've never seen this before. I've never seen a bird basically have a kamikaze mission for a fish. Right? And when it went in, I was the only one on the beach, and there was a guy about 30 feet to my right. And when he went in, I was like, oh, he was gone, what did he do? And then he came out, I was like, he's alive, there he is. And it was like that verbal, and the guy beside me sort of looked over, grabbed his stuff, and walked away. But I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Here's a fish, so I go home, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling my wife, I'm like, I'm like Amy, this is, this is amazing. Birds, birds don't swim, and there's no way that was done by momentum. There's no way. It hit the water, gets a fish, gets out of there simply by moving. It had to learn how to swim. And I go to home and I tell my wife, and I'm telling her about this, and she's looking at me. And guys, do this as a side note. If you marry someone who is smarter than you are, uh, these little novelties don't last very long. So she's staring at me uh, like a lot of you are staring at me. And she's saying, well, well, yeah, like birds fish, like they, they can swim, they get down there. And she was really nice about it, almost kind of felt sorry for me, but it, it, but it, was, it was more than this, well, what do you expect? Birds don't jump into, into the beaks of fish, they swim. I said, they don't swim, birds that fly don't swim. She said, what about penguins? I said, penguins don't fly, that's the thing, swimming is their thing. She said, no, no, birds, birds. so I went online. Right? And, and I'm not that I'm going to prove it wrong, but I, I went online. I wanted to go online. And, and, and I put it in the thing called the Google, which seems to know everything. And I thought, hopefully nothing comes back. And it turns out that there are actually a lot of fish, a lot of birds that, that, that know how to swim. I was, I was wrong uh, again. Uh, and some are like my uh, Peruvian friends. Some uh, land on uh, the shore and then just dip down. And they'll swim down, it's the funniest thing to see, for maybe, maybe 30, 40 feet. But the most impressive, uh, this is the one, the one I saw, the most impressive was the gannet. Now the gannet flies along, in, in, it's in the uh, uh, northern Atlantic, it flies along, and as you can imagine, it looks down, not for a specific target, but it looks down for sort of a, a school or a stain of fish. And when he sees it, not exactly knowing what it is, he does this. sees the same, and then basically dives. Dives full bore, turns himself into somewhat, ooh, ooh, hurts to watch, uh, somewhat of a, of a torpedo. Um, he, he transforms his body into somewhat of a, a missile, launches in head first, hitting the water at 60 miles an hour, that's 100, 100 kilometers an hour, piercing the surface above for what it can barely see. 
Now I can go as far down as 50 feet below to find something to feed on, to grab it, often eat it down below, and then use its wings somehow to swim back up to the surface. And as you can imagine, this is, this is really dangerous. At 60 miles an hour, if they hit the surface at the wrong angle, even just a few degrees off, they can snap their neck and die just like that. And for those who make it, there's still a risk of colliding with a dolphin, or worse, with a shark feeding on the same prey. But to these birds, it's worth it. They've seen it work, they've learned from those before them and those around them, and despite the danger, despite the risk, it seems that to them, there is no better way to feed, to transform themselves into somewhat of a missile to go full throttle, head first in the water, for the bigger fish down below for the abundance that they can't get on the surface. At Salisbury, and more specifically in this chapel, every Tuesday and every Friday, we are inviting each other to essentially do the same thing. To use the gifts and abilities that we have, including hunger, to search for some sign of life, and while we might not be, be able to see exactly what it is, to dive in, to draw closer, despite the risk, with the hope that we might find something on which to feed. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter from, uh, from the letter we just read, uh, was one of the first Christian theologians. He would write these letter, letters to the communities and encourage them and instruct them on ways to live as a loving community based on the life and the teachings of Jesus. And so when he writes to Christians in Rome, he had never been to Rome, but he knew what Rome was like. Rome was a hub of culture and activity, it was diverse and a cosmopolitan center. And often when people of Rome worshiped their gods, they might go to a shrine or find a statue or an image of that particular God and there that you would take a request for something that that God could provide. Then you would offer a sacrifice, food or wine or even an animal, with the expectation that this particular God, because of the offering, would comply with your request. It's what we might call a transactional relationship. If you were a sailor, for example, you might offer a dove or grain to the god of sea, Neptune or Poseidon, uh, and with that, expect that god to provide safe sailing. And that may be the extent of the relationship. It was logical, it was individual, it was simple, it was predictable, it was a give and take, sort of a trade. It was transactional, right? So Paul writes to the churches in Rome to those surrounded by this understanding of the way someone gets what they want, what they need from the God, and he invites them, he encourages them to do something very strange, if not illogical from people watching from a distance. He tells them essentially to dive in, to risk going deep, to offer not just a simple sacrifice of an animal or grain, uh, not for the interest of the individual, but offer everything for the interest of community. Present your bodies, he writes, as a living sacrifice. The word translated as body is better understood as the total person, the whole self, your mind, your heart, the gifts you bring every day. Dive in, the whole self, head first, offer it, because life is more than just trading favors, getting what you want as an individual. It's about taking risks for something that you can't quite see from a distance. It's about diving in the uncontrollable, unpredictable world that is community. Paul is inviting them, their total selves, each with their own gifts, to sacrifice lives of mere transactions for lives of transformation. Transformation that can only happen in that loving community. In the Roman world, this was illogical. It was crazy. The majority of the religions were not necessarily about community. People aren't supposed to offer themselves to something they couldn't control or predict any more than birds were supposed to be able to swim. But to Paul, this was the path toward wisdom. Do not be conformed by this world, he writes but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you might find out what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
For we who are many are one body. And individually, we are members one of another. Now some of yourselves may feel like you're in uncharted waters here at Salisbury. An all-boys school far from home with people of different worlds where twice a week we come into this chapel. Some may say it feels completely illogical, strange like a fish out of water or like a bird swimming 40 feet below the surface. And to some of you, it might be the best part of your week. It might make perfect sense. But for most of you, I suspect, you're somewhere in between. And that's the beauty of a place and a gathering like this. We've all come just less than a week ago from our different lives, from Spain and Ghana and China and Canada and North Carolina and Colorado, all with these different experiences and understanding about what that something beyond we can see might actually be. And here, gathering together, we have the opportunity to learn from those before us and those around us. We'll hear from members of this body. We will learn and be invited to try something new. We'll have guests. A Muslim imam, a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest, a Native American spiritual healer, all with different ideas about the abundance that we can't quite reach from the surface. And we can sit back, float along and pick and choose as if chapel is nothing more than a series of transactions, or we can learn to swim with the hope of more, with the hope of transformation. And Paul doesn't go into the details about how to dive in because I think it looks different to each one of us. But he gives all of us a starting point. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, he writes, but think with sober judgment. Be humble. Be honest. Be authentic. Be open. Be compassionate. And what we might find, what the real risk is, if we're willing to offer ourselves to dive in, is that we learn that we're not just sons and brothers of a particular family or citizens of a particular country or members of a particular club or team that we can put on an application to get in a better college where Salisbury is nothing more than a transaction to get me to the next step. But with humility, the real risk is being transformed from many members, each with their own gifts and functions into a body, one body, members of one another, a community, a kinship, a brotherhood. That is the hope for this year. That is the invitation. That is the feast. Let us pray. God, who in the first days hovered over the waters, yet entered their depth and called forth order and light and life and abundance, and it was good. We come to these, our first days, bringing all that we are, our hope, our anxiety, our joy, our hungers. And we pray you hover over us once again, calling forth life and light and abundance so that we might feed, so that we might be transformed, so that we might be grateful, so that we might be a body, compassionate, hopeful, joyful, grateful. And through that and with that, may we learn what it means to say thank you. Amen. Amen.